fool I'm insane, so right for you When the ship goes down Look in your dreams, that's where I'll be Cause I need, 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 need you And I la 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 But I wanna, wanna, wanna Just stay the night When you're faded and alone And need somebody on the phone Let it be me Let it be me Please welcome to the stage Robin Bender Ginn, Executive Director, OpenJS Foundation. Welcome. Good morning. Hey, friends. I think I have some friends in here. Hey. Hey. Um, I'm Robin Ginn. I am the Executive Director of the OpenJS Foundation. Not here to talk JavaScript this morning, but here to welcome you all. Um, Angela Brown was going to be with you. She's not feeling well. So um, Angela's our Senior Vice President and General Manager at the Linux Foundation. Um, and since I'm part of the Linux Foundation, I thought, well, I'm just thrilled to be here. Um, you know, wow, we have 2,400 attendees joining that we know of and 1,200 in person. So that's pretty awesome. So thanks for showing up. Yeah. Great. Um, and let me just grab this. And you know, we're here really thanks to our sponsors. Really could not do that without them. Um, thank you, AWS, for being a diamond sponsor. Big shout out to Google, another diamond sponsor. Hey, Google. And let's give it up for IBM, also a diamond sponsor. Great. Um, also, our platinum sponsors, Anaconda, CNCF, Delta Lake, Intel, Meta, Red Hat. Thanks so much. And wow, this blows my mind. Look at all of these other uh, pro folks who are working on the program committee and really help bring this all together. Really put on a great show for you this week, and I'm really excited to have a fun week in Austin. Great. Amazing. Thanks, everyone. Okay, and I'm going to give you some quick housekeeping notes before we get started because we have a full week and lots to do. Uh, we have a sponsor showcase and coffee breaks on ballroom, uh, in the ballroom on level four. Um, flip the back of your uh, badges. If you haven't done that yet, you'll see the Wi-Fi information and a link. Um, and tonight at the iconic Stubbs Barbecue, it's so good. There is an all attendee welcome. It's from six to nine. Uh, there's indoor spaces as well with some AC. It sounds like we're gonna need that today as well as, well as some fans outdoors, so that'll be fun. Uh, food and drinks, bands, um, and so uh, find a way to get there and it'll be uh, a lot of fun. We also have um, Ask the Expert sessions today and Thursday at lunch, so check your schedule. Those are always great and really interactive. Um, one of my favorites are, is the women's lunch at Arlo Gray Restaurant. Um, no RSVP necessary. Again, plenty of space for those who would like to come. Um, so let's just jump in. But actually, before we get started, I do want to remind everybody uh, that we do have our event code of conduct. Um, we take this very seriously. Um, and essentially, everybody should just feel welcome and included um, and be professional, treat each other with, with respect. But again, let's just have some fun um, in, our, uh, in our Austin, uh, with our Austin community today. Um, so speaking of everyone feeling included, you know, June is a really cool month. Um, it's Pride Month, uh, where we celebrate uh, with LGBTQ plus communities um, and just allowing everybody to be their true self. 
Um, it's also a time uh, where it's Juneteenth, uh, where we co uh, commemorate the end of slavery in the United States. Um, yeah, really important. Yeah. And really appreciate all of you who took, you know, that holiday to travel to be here with us today. That was really important. Um, and, you know, equality for, for all is really important. And, uh, you know, it's been a big topic of conversation with my family, multiple generations, different places, just how horrified we've been with some of the discriminatory uh, laws and policies being, being inter introduced in states like Texas and many others across the United States. Um, so, you know, a lot of things that um, my mom and aunties fought for, I always say, have just are starting to unwind. So um, our next speaker is going to talk more about equality, um, and they're fabulous. If you've not seen Ava Black speak, you have this opportunity today. So today I'd like to welcome Ava Black, who is an open source hacker and consent advocate. Ava. <laughs> Morning, everybody. Welcome to Austin. So, morning. Thank you. Yes. Come on, shout it out. Good morning. Welcome. Robin was just telling us all a little bit about the state of affairs and yesterday's holiday. I'm going to talk about defending tolerance a little bit. Um, some of you might know I've been an open source developer for quite a while. I've worked on some pretty awesome projects. I've built some pretty cool things over the, over the years, about 23 years now working in this community. Uh, today I serve on a couple boards and technical advisory committees. Uh, in the past I worked in the Kubernetes Code of Conduct Committee and on the board of the Consent Academy. But I'm not here to talk about any of those. I'm here today just as myself, not representing anybody or, any, or my employer, because all around the country and especially right here in Texas, Politicians are calling for the removal of trans people from society. They're passing laws that make it harder to exist for people like me. This is not some abstract threat. The Texas governor and <clears throat> attorney general are trying to actually make it, uh, trying to take kids away from loving, supportive parents based merely on the suspicion that the kid is gender non-conforming, like I was. You see, when I was about 10, <clears throat> My friends all knew that I was one of the girls. Teachers didn't really understand this. That dissonance was difficult. And my greatest fear back then was just being taken away from my parents for being different. 30 years later, we're still here. We're still having the same fight. The reality is, over that time, probably due to increased uh, social acceptance, more people are coming out as either transgender or gender non-conforming. This uh, picture is from a Pew Research study published about a week or two ago that shows that today about one and a half percent of all adults in the U.S. identify as either transgender or non-binary. That is almost as common as having red hair. And it's also about five million people, five million potential contributors to your projects, most of whom are under 30 and currently facing discrimination which is, as Robin said, a violation of the Code of Conduct. It's also incompatible with the very principles of open source. The open source definition number five, right here. But just saying this does not prevent it. You know what does prevent discrimination? Actions, your actions. After all, open source communities are duocracies, so it's on you to make your communities inclusive and welcoming to the next generation of developers. Whether you're building a product for your company or you're leading a project, you need to understand how the already marginalized members of your communities are treated. When we fail to do this, we perpetuate systemic harm. Even unconsciously, we can perpetuate discrimination. You know, about a week ago, a colleague asked me, hey, Ava, why does it seem like every trans woman I know is a software developer? Right? There's a trope for a reason. This is also called survivorship bias. I am here 23 years later because I survived where a lot of my high school friends didn't. 
They were pushed out, kicked out by their parents, marginalized by society, or medically tortured to try to make them cisgender again, which never worked. 10 years after high school, my first girlfriend was homeless and dead because of this. This isn't abstract. And this isn't some both sides issue. This isn't some woke lib thing. This is really about making communities of practice resistant to discrimination. Because if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, we will, then, then the tolerant will be destroyed and tolerance with them. Trans and gender nonconforming people are in our developer communities, in our social communities, in our cities, they're all around us, and we are facing an onslaught of intolerance today. And technology is not neutral. Tech is a tool. This is part of what I love about open source. We build tools that other people use. These tools can affect the entire world. That list I showed on the first slide has affected the entire world. That's amazing. So ask yourself, in your communities, are you working to defend tolerance? Are you building tools that create a more equitable world for the next generation or for people who don't get to contribute to it? And to help create a more inclusive community, we also need to evolve our tools of community stewardship. For about the past decade, I think codes of conduct have often been seen as a tool to punish bad behavior. I want to challenge all of us to see them instead as a tool to create restorative outcomes, to create safe space, to address conflict in healthy ways, and to address unconscious bias or unconscious discrimination with support and training. And code of conduct committees in all of our communities need tangible support to do this. They need funding, they need training, uh, they need their managers to give them the time to perform the stewardship or the incident response. When a, a conduct incident happens, it's emotionally complex, difficult work that today is mostly invisible, falls on the shoulders of volunteers who already have full-time jobs, and it burns them out. But this is the stewardship of open source that is not tracked in GitHub stars or commit stats. And without this stewardship, a project is just an echo chamber. So remember, to build inclusive communities of practice, you cannot tolerate discrimination, especially against the already marginalized. And trans youth right here in Texas and around the country face disproportionate rates of homelessness. You can do something about that. Uh, you might have seen a sign near the check-in. The Linux Foundation is offering to match up to $10,000 in donations to these orgs that are here in Texas doing awesome work. Uh, there's a couple of us that are also putting up another $10,000. So if you make a donation, it'll be tripled. If your employer matches and my employer matches, that's five times. Make a donation this week, post a, a, a screenshot, follow the LF's tagging of that, and reply to me on Twitter with it. Thank you. Amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, discrimination is bad business. We know that, and we know we can build better software with diverse communities. So thank you so much, Ava. Um, our next speaker is Eric Brewer. Um, Eric, would you like to come on up and join? Eric joined uh, Google back in 2011. He's currently the vice president of infrastructure. Uh, he leads the company's uh, uh, infrastructure design, including Google Cloud Platform, Kubernetes, Anthos, and you all may know him with his recent uh, focus on security. Um, Eric helped found the Open Source Security Software Foundation, Open SSF, yep. as we all know it. Um, we care a lot about that in the JavaScript world, of course, and today he's gonna talk about how we can all step up and make trust and security important in open source. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, a challenge and an honor to follow Ava, and uh, I, I am moved. So what I want to talk about is quite different and uh, arguably less important, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. And I think it's uh, 
I'm trying to move the community, as you'll see in a certain sense. So the good news is open source kind of won, right? It's basically incredibly uh, ubiquitous in all the things that we use. And I think it's mostly because it enables high velocity. And because of that, groups that use open source get more done. Reuse and innovation matters. Now, that's what we're celebrating. Yay, we won. <laughs> However, you can celebrate that. This is good. Um, and of course, that means what really is in all the things we use in society. And because of that, we actually have to be worthy of the trust that is placed in open source. Now, I think we are worthy by our intentions, right? I think people are working hard to make open source fantastic and secure. But we have more to do. It's not easy. And in fact, it's not funded properly, which I'll get to in a bit. So if you want things like you know, electric grids and water supplies and oil pipelines to use open source, which they do, and you want to count on them, which you do, we need to collectively do something about that. So this is a problem for the world to solve. But I want to see us solve it in a way that does not say, don't use open source, which is, by the way, on the table for some governments. right? I want them to, not to say, you know, maintainers do more, which is also on the table. They're not going to work. Maintainers are awesome. Thank you. Uh, we need a solution that actually keeps what we love about open source, but enables us to make it trustworthy. Because these incidents are real and costly. This is just a little map from 2021. You might have heard some of these, SolarWinds, Lock4j. SolarWinds has actually open source in it. The open source equivalent is CodeCov, which is all open source. It had actually many different kinds of attacks inside it. So these things matter. And of course, there's a natural outcome from these attacks, which is essentially top-down pressure to fix it. And if you're not already feeling this pressure, you will feel it. It's the source of the Biden executive order. It is the source of regulations like FedRAMP, which basically say, for at least for government projects, you can't have, it literally says you can't have vulnerabilities in your containers. By the way, you all have vulnerabilities in containers. You're all breaking the law if you run on FedRAMP. It's not practically enforceable at the moment. I don't know how many people in the government actually know that. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't tell them. Uh, and it's not just the US. I was in Germany a few weeks ago meeting with the German government. I had discussions last night with Open UK and their concerns about the UK government. And finally, if you're a citizen of any of these countries or any other countries, you probably should care too. You actually would want your government to view things like open source in critical systems as something they should care about. Right? That doesn't mean you think they can do a good job, but you still want them to care about it. So, and it's not just governments, it's actually brands too. You think of some famous brand failures like Equifax using a very old version of Java struts, basically killed them, right? So they should have cared a lot more than they did about the quality of security of open source. You may have heard about this event. This is a, a legal request on the, related to Log4j. This is from Daniel Stenberg. And the letter on the right is basically an actual legal letter he got from a lawyer saying, oh, you open source people are bad. You're causing me problems. You need to fix it. I'll tell you what the letter says, basically. It essentially says, oh, we use your thing that uses Log4j, so we need a response in 24 hours. You know, what happened to you? You know, what bad things have happened? And by the way, what is your plan to fix it? And tell me the steps and dates. Now, these should either scare you or, or make you laugh. Right? It's, it's a stupid letter, right? It's stupid because this is not how open source works, right? This is not a company that was paying for this stuff. They were getting it for free. And that really gets to the root of the challenge and where I want to go, which is open source. We know about the free puppy thing. This is the free puppy thing. But it literally says as is all over the place. Like almost every file says as is, as is, as is, as is which is why you can't send him a legal letter that says, do all this stuff for me. Because you told him it's as is, right? You were very clear. Good for us, clarity. Uh, now, on top of that, of course, you know, it's hard to do this work, this limited investment. In fact, things that are not fun, like mundane things like writing test cases and 
and security practices do get less investment because they're less fun, right? I don't, I'm not actually complaining about that. I think it's, it's a fact of life for open source. But this is where we are. Uh, it doesn't mean it can't be secure. We, I, think, I still believe generally that all eyes make bugs shallow. It's just that the eyes aren't looking in the right places. Right? There's plenty of places that have no eyes on them, and not surprisingly, those get attacked. And, and there's famous cases of they, literally the maintainer handed over control of his project because he, wasn't, he didn't care about it anymore. So that's zero eyes. But it still has the potential to be secure. So I want to distinguish, though, to get to the next step, which is between distribution, which is what package managers are really good at. They maximize availability and make it easy to find packages, and accountability, which is what I think we need a bit more of. So accountability you can think of as what you know, famously you know, Red Hat does or Debian, where for money you get a supported version of a package, not all packages, but some packages, and those include things like some liability protection, security patches, right? some promises, like duration, like end of life support. So any of you can do either of these roles, but we actually need to clarify which role are you playing? Are you just distributing stuff as is? That's fine, that's distribution. Or are you trying to be accountable for it and provide security patches and other kinds of support? That's accountability, right? And we need both roles. And again, you can individually play both roles, companies can play both roles, but we need to know which role we're playing. So you can think about it this way, we have these kind of top-down expectations about what we're supposed to do, and again, maybe even coming regulations. We have as-is open source at the bottom. These are not very compatible, actually. That's really the root challenge here. And so the rest of this talk is about what I'm going to call curation, which is what can we do to get some accountability in the middle, which you can think of as a subset of open source that's curated and provides actual things like security patches. And of course, this costs money, which is a good and bad thing. It's bad because we don't have good mechanisms yet to actually move money around in open source. I actually hope to fix that. But it also means the people on top actually have the money and are actually willing to pay it, right? There are examples where money is flowing downward uh, to get these things, to, including the Red Hat license famously, but there are other examples as well. So what you do in this curation later, well, you fix vulnerabilities. In practice, it means you need to fix the old versions that are widely in use, not just the top of the tree. Uh, you need to deal with the dependencies of that. You need to deal with things like automat automatic testing and tracking. You probably need a service level agreement. You might need some liability protection. These are all things that you can imagine a curator doing. And I don't, we don't need to decide exactly what they are, but they're basically be of service to the top-down pressure <laughs> that's coming at us and intercept those issues to keep them off of essentially everybody else. Right? That's, a, that's a, a role that would benefit both sides. But it's not as simple as just a magic curation layer. I want to break it down a little bit. So some kinds of curation you could do today. You can imagine, well, I'm a maintainer and I actually do all the stuff to support it perfectly well. I'm going to be both roles, a curator and a maintainer. You can look at things like Databricks or any kind of monetized open source where the, the paid for version of Databricks does in fact come with support, and does in fact come with security patches because their customers expect that. So that's another proven model of one way to get accountability with open source. But it's going to get more complicated than that, and I actually think that's good. I actually expect you'll see curators on top of curators. Like, German government would like to curate stuff for the use of Germany. They will probably not do all of it themselves. They'll probably sit on top of other curators, maybe multiple other curators, because right? that's a better use of the space. And there's not just one top-down entity. Those gray boxes kind of capture the idea that there are many different top-down groups with different expectations, all of which need curation. So that's the kind of place I think we're going to have to go. Google has a small product in this space called Assured OSS, which I don't want to spend much time on, but I just want to say it's kind of like for the packages that we're already supporting for our internal use, for making those available, it will be for a fee that's not yet determined because it's a new thing. But basically, for these packages, you can get them from us and we'll give you security patches, including for old popular versions. And by the way, these are not forks. These are intended to be short-term changes to fix things and then get those changes upstream. 
So what should you want out of a curator as a maintainer? Because you don't have to work with curators either. It's still as is. It's a choice of the maintainer is which curators to work with and why. But we should t try and figure out what makes a good curator. And I think we, I can guess some of these things, right? The first thing is you don't send me legal letters. Make contributions, not demands. But I think we could get a lot farther with submitting good pull requests. Like, you tell me what you want in a pull request. It would be nice if, for example, passed all your test cases, right? It, would be, it should be easy to review, right? They should, in fact, add test cases. The test cases enable the kind of velocity that we're after. Share the wealth. If they're getting paid, how can we get that money, at least some of it, to maintainers? I don't have a proposal yet on that, but I do think it's the right direction. And finally, when we're in a crisis like a log4j, what can curators do to help not only with the code, but with the customers and the transitions and the distribution of upgrades and even the education? There's lots of roles a curator can play. We need some tooling. For example, it'd be good broadly for open source if it was easy for third parties to build your packages. If you have jar files, can someone else build it? And I think that helps a lot because if I can build it, I can test it. I would say, without making promises, if Google could build your open source package and test it, we'd probably be willing to do that at our own expense. Right? We already do that for Kubernetes. We build and test all kinds of things for Kubernetes. Right? It makes Kubernetes better. It's at our, it's our, at our expense. Uh, we'd get some salsa provenance out of this. There's a few other ideas in this general, idea, general space. But basically, we need to enable automation. We need to enable other people to do testing because uh, it will cause more tests to actually get done. If we could fix some versioning and a few things like that, that would be nice too. I'm not going to cover those today, but there's lots of challenges there with, with lack of clarity. So what can you do? Well, I think there's a few kinds of things you can do. If you're a government enterprise, which I suspect very few of you are, but some of you work for some, uh, you can decide, you know, more carefully, where do you want as is open source and where do you actually really want curated stuff, right? If, you, if you're going to have expectations and want to enforce those expectations, you need to use some kind of curation, right? Now, there isn't a lot of curation available today, but we're going to hopefully collectively fix that, right? And you should expect to pay for curation. It costs real money. OPEX for testing is real money. Headcount for fixing old versions is, is real money. It's not easy to do and it's not fun to do, right? Backpatching changes to old versions. It's never on high on people's list of things to do. Uh, I will say for Google, people know we do things like Kubernetes, but actually 75% of the repos we contribute to are not Google-owned projects. And I, I think that's important to mention because it's kind of easy to get companies to work on their own projects. It's do they work on other projects that are important to them? For example, do they work on the projects that are in their dependencies? Kubernetes has 800, 1,000 dependencies. Google should be willing to work on all of those, right? Just on principle of this is something that we're using, we should support it. If you're a maintainer, you know, there's lots of things to do, but I would say, besides the basics, do you want to do curation, assuming you could get paid for it? I think that's a discussion we're gonna have. And uh, I'm speaking of basics, that you all have uh, two FA keys on your seats, so if you didn't notice those, those are from Google. Please use them. <laughs> Hope they're not like a new concept. Uh, we'll be giving away lots of these in the next several years, like repeatedly, because this is an important part of, of the basics practice. Do you want to do curation? Do you want to work with curators and start thinking about what would make a good relationship with a curator for you, right? And I think that's a, that's a bilateral discussion that we need to have as a community. What about for your dependencies? Where, why do you trust them? Are they curated? Would you want a curated version for them if you could get it? Would you like to get notified of vulnerabilities in those dependencies that you have? Right? That's, again, how much work you want to put in on this and how does it work together? And please think about how to enable build and test by others. For example, when we do fuzzing, to fuzz your stuff, we have to be able to build it. Right? And so if you can enable it, not only does that mean curators can build it and test it, again, at their expense, but also any third party with goodwill can build it and test it and actually make the community better. And finally, salsa provenance, if you're doing things that are not just source code, things like jar files, how are they built? What's the provenance of those? We want to use those as, as artifacts and other projects. We need the provenance. So trustworthy open source is where we need to get to. It's not easy. I'm working on lots of things towards that. I'll just say that 
you know, I helped start OpenSF because I want a neutral place to talk about these issues. They're not easy. I'm working with governments to argue that governments should be funding this thing. That includes the White House summits, but now also a few other countries. And I think we need this missing layer of curation. And it's, I think it's the path that will get us to the open source we want with a buffer between us and the top-down pressure that is coming fast, right? And if we don't have a solution that addresses that top-down pressure, it's not gonna go our way. So, so think about curation and work in this general direction. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. Wow, thank you, Eric. Um, super grateful for everything you're doing at Google, at the OpenSSF. Um, and grateful for all of our maintainers and collaborators who are working on stuff that I know keeps me up at night. Um, I'm going to put this here. Our next speakers need no introduction. It's become kind of a, a great tradition, and we're really excited uh, to welcome back um, open source veteran Dirk Hondolf, who is now the chief open source strategist at the, Car at the Cardona Foundation. And the creator of uh, Linux and Git, Linus Torvalds. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Great. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Great. 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 Wow, that's quite a crowd. Yeah. That is packed. Nice. So my name is Dirk Hondel. I'm the chief open source officer for the Cardano Foundation, which I joined a couple of months ago, I'm focused on building stronger open source communities and ecosystems around our blockchain technologies. This guy does... Yeah, I'm Linus, and the reason we do these uh, fireside chats is I, I do software, I don't do public talking, and this makes it much easier for me. Uh, so. So you don't need to prepare, I need to prepare. You that, is, that is exactly the plan. This way, especially I have a, I used to do public speaking and I always hated it. And one of the big issues was I don't know what people are interested in and it's so hard to make that judgment call. So I kind of threw that over the fence to Dirk. So he, he asks the questions and hopefully if he asks bad questions, it's not my fault. Right? <laughs> okay, so if it's a good session, it's his fault. If it's a bad session, it's exactly. my fault. Yeah. Good thing we sorted this. So we are actually for the first time in Austin with the Open Source Summit, yeah. uh, which is kind of cool. Um, how many of you are local? Yeah, quite a few. So last time I was in Austin, we had snowfall. Uh, yeah. don't, don't think that will happen today. Yeah. Um, Travel is kind of interesting, so the locals are lucky. Travel right now is quite a challenge. Uh, lines at the Portland airport yesterday were absolutely insane. And I hear a lot of people had missed flights and, and, and many problems. It's, it's really a changing world. Seeing so many people in the room is actually super exciting. But we've seen a lot of change over the last few years. How has that affected you, Linus, as the person? The fact that you don't go to that many conferences, that you know, you always sit at home, right? Yeah, actually, one of the things we did notice, this whole COVID mess uh, affected the kernel almost not at all, <laughs> which is uh, a lot. Well, I mean, it, I, I take some of that back. I'm sure it affected a lot of developers and, uh, and a lot of the infrastructure and QA people a lot. But from a development standpoint, uh, somebody actually did the statistics and the first few months in various lockdowns, our productivity actually went up. Because we've always worked all over email and most people were working from home. I've been working from home for, for 20 years. So the last few years may have been difficult for other reasons, but at least, at least from a development standpoint, uh, I, I think we were very prepared in the kernel community. It was pretty interesting. So at, when I was still at VMware and, and the uh, lockdowns hit, there was a lot of conversation about learning how to work remotely, learning to work with suddenly distributed teams, learning to work more over email and less face-to-face. -face. And we were always joking that, well, we've been doing that for a long time. <laughs> so to us, it didn't feel as new. But you've talked about, about the impact on Linux and, and how things are continuing. And if I look at the, the latest, the, the RC3 for 519, 
uh, has anything changed compared to the past? I mean, this seems pretty calm. It was a small patch set. So uh, we are in the situation. I, uh, how many people here are actually directly involved with the kernel, just out of interest? Not very many. So I'll just explain for the rest of you that we've actually had a very standardized way of doing releases for the last 15 plus years. I mean, uh, I started Git in 2005, and it took a few years for people to get on with the new world order. But, but basically, for 15 years, uh, we've, we've had the same process. We've, we've had the same release schedules. Uh, and, and in that sense, kernel development has been very calm and very, let's say, staid. Uh, not exciting from a process standpoint. And that's actually exactly what I think yeah. you want. You want to have a stable process so that people don't get upset about how all the infrastructure is changing. Uh, at the same time, I have to say, I'm still surprised. I mean, I've been doing this for uh, 30 years plus now. And uh, the fact that we may have a boring and staid development process does not, has not meant that we have a boring and staid development itself. We actually have lots of core stuff happening, and, and I'm really happy to see that. Uh, you'd think that after 30 years, you'd, your, your project would kind of grow boring. And we're actively not doing that. And trying, I'm, I'm actually actively trying to encourage people to do the exciting stuff. And we're having new architectures coming. We have people try new languages, with obviously Rust being discussed widely. Uh, we're having all these things. We're having even core code that we've had around forever. Uh, and people still end up rewriting it or improving it in fundamental ways. So it's not just at the edge that, that the kernel is growing. And that, I think, is one of the things that I personally enjoy the most, that, that we're not a dead project. <laughs> one, of, one of the things that uh, you have often talked about that was part of the success for Linux was this idea that you, you say the, the user space APIs ha cannot be broken. They are considered uh, a promise. And a lot of discussion is, is going into this right now. What is actually this API? And right. in, in the context of eBPF, and more and more things being implemented not through the system calls, but through eBPF, where is that point where your API ends and, and crazy space begins? Well, I think the crazy space is hopefully all internal. Uh, we've got that part down. Uh, I've actually, so I don't like the f notion that people talk about APIs. Because let's face it, some people then look at documentation, right? And say, this is the API. This is what we documented. If you don't do what we documented, it's on you, right? And I feel that's a complete cop-out, and uh, it's, it's just bad policy. Uh, documentation is worthless compared to reality. and. Uh, I say that as a software engineer who never writes documentation. So uh, par part of this is my own personal biases, obviously. But my rule has always been, it's not that we can't break the API. You, I tell my sub-maintainers and, and developers all the time that you can change anything, but you can't break people's loads. You can't break what people do. And if they take advantage of a bug in the kernel, that bug is not a bug. It's a feature. And we will maintain that feature forever unless there are like really pressing concerns. And usually, the only really pressing concern is security, uh, where we will go to insane lengths to, to actually keep bug for bug compatibility, because as a user, which I also am, the most annoying thing I can imagine is doing a software upgrade and things stop working, right? And I can't affect the fact that every single package around me may have different policies. But when it comes to the kernel, I've uh, been very hard-nosed about the policy that when it comes Kernel does not do that. If you upgrade the kernel, you should feel safe 
in knowing that whatever you used to do will still continue to work. And if it doesn't, you're supposed to scream at us, right? You're not supposed to say, oh, I operated the kernel and now I need to change what I used to do. No, you should feel like it's a bug report if something breaks. And, and we've been pretty successful with that and I feel very strongly about it. And I wish, since most of you are not kernel developers, I wish that you would push for this kind of policy on your project because it makes it so much better for all your users. And in the end, we're all in this for the technology and we are in this because we enjoy programming, hopefully. But in the end, it's really the users that matter. A project with no users is not a project. It's just you playing with your own code. But I'll, I'll, I'll poke at this a little bit. Because what is, what is a user space application? So I, I mentioned eBPF programs, yep. which people consider user space. Yep. I mentioned kernel modules. You know, especially third-party kernel modules. So, so where, is that, where is that line of what can't be broken? So we, I have made the line be, if you start doing kernel work and you do your own kernel modules, at that point, when the kernel makes changes, it's on you to make changes to your kernel modules. And we heavily discourage third-party kernel modules anyway, but sometimes they're good as a development path. Maybe you have something you want to include eventually, but you're not ready yet and you're just trying things out. And then a third party kernel module is absolutely the way to go. Sometimes it's done for bad reasons, often licensing, often we want to hide it. And there's a fine line where copyright is and, and the GPL licenses when is it actually uh, derived work and when is it not? And I don't want to go there, I'm not a lawyer, I discourage it, but, but because I'm not a lawyer, I don't know when that gray area turns into black, right? But at that point, it's your problem. Uh, but any user program that is part of user workflow, and whether it uses eBPF or whether it uses anything else, um, is generally on us to fix. And, and obviously it depends on, if you're inside a big company, a lot of people use eBPF for doing things like tracing and statistics and debugging. And that may be so low level to the kernel that when you use it in that way and the kernel changes, yes, it will break and we can't do anything about that. So when I talk about users, I talk about users, not, not people who are digging into the kernel. So, so you mentioned a moment ago um, that uh, things stay innovative, things keep evolving, new things are coming. A year ago, we talked a little bit about a Rust kernel uh, code, and uh, where is that? I haven't seen any, any actual patches being merged yet. Um, the patches are out there. They have not been merged. One thing, the kernel has gotten a bit more careful over the years. Let's put it that way. We were doing, we were more freewheeling 30 years ago. We definitely, I mean, it was more of a wild west where uh, somebody came up with a great idea and sent a patch and it would just get merged because, hey, why not? And, and we can't really afford to do that. And a lot of people actually think we're somewhat too risk averse. Yeah. So, um, when it comes to Rust, it's being discussed for multiple years by now. It's getting to the point where, real soon now, uh, we will actually have it merged in the kernel. Uh, maybe next release. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> before the Rust people get all excited, right? You know who you are. Uh, to to me, it's um, it's a trial run, right? It's a way of making. A, we want to have the memory safety. So there are real technical reasons why Rust is a good idea in the kernel. But at the same time, it's one of those things. We tried C++ 25 plus years ago, and uh, we tried it for two weeks, and then we stopped trying it. Uh, so, so to me, Rust is a way to 
uh, to try something new and, uh, and hopefully it works out and people have been working on it a lot so I really hope it works out because otherwise they'll be bummed. But at the same time it's going to start out with being very small and very specific parts of the kernel. We're not rewriting it all in Rust. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's one of those things that technical people want to do something new and fun and I think Rust makes a lot of technical sense. So. I want to point out, I love being at a conference where you get applause for transgender rights and for Rust kernel modules. <laughs> Thank you. So the role of a maintainer is very much one of having good taste, is how you often describe it, uh, pattern recognition, being able to look at patches, and, and very quickly usually have an idea, okay, this goes the right direction or here's a problem. What is the challenge with a very much non-C-like language? I mean, C++ is very C-like, but Rust is very different. What is the challenge for the way the kernel community works if suddenly maintainers get Rust code? I don't, I don't see that as a big issue. I mean, we've had other languages in in the kernel. Mostly, they've all been about the build subsystem, mm -hmm. but I'm quite used to seeing Perl code or our make files are <laughs> make files in name only. <laughs> they are a unholy mess of various <laughs> macros and other helper functions that are really hard to understand. And I'm in the situation where if somebody sends me a, a patch with some of the scripting and the make files, I don't, I don't even pretend to understand Perl. Uh, I'm one of those people who think that Perl is a write-only language. Yes. Uh, Absolutely. And, uh, and I'm perfectly happy to trust maintainers. That has been my policy for the longest time, that I trust people to do the right thing until they screw up and then I sometimes um, overly impolite, and if I've been impolite to any of you in the audience, I apologize. It's, it's, uh, it's a personal failing of mine, and I mean that in, I mean very seriously, that I sometimes go overboard. Uh, but um, um, in a loving way. No, no. I wish, <laughs> I wish I could say that. I. I have had to apologize multiple times, so let me preemptively apologize to the Rust people. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think that introducing Rust, I have seen the worries about it, meaning that people don't understand Rust, and that's okay. People don't understand the VM subsystem even when it's written in C. So uh, the language is usually not the biggest hindrance to understanding. We will have maintainers for the Rust parts exactly the same way we have maintainers for the VM parts, and, and that's not really, it's a small technical change, not a fundamental one. So, so Rust, obviously, memory safety, there is a lot of the security topics that Eric just talked uh, about, and, and we just in the la latest RC had another set of fixes for interesting hardware features. Um, uh, this is, this is an ongoing, ongoing event for us. We see some of the very well-maintained architectures, so x86, ARM64, some of the bigger ones fairly frequently coming out, especially with those speculation fixes. Um, but we have so many architectures in the kernel. Are the others safe, or are they just not as well-maintained? Um. I think it's a bit of both. So this is something that's been going on now for about five years, since Meltdown and the first version of Spectre happened, where people are much more aware that even if you write secure software, which, let's be honest, it's is hard. rare and hard, uh, the hardware sometimes ends up really screwing you over anyway. and. Uh, the kernel is certainly not the only project that sees this. If you're doing uh, browser development, if you're doing virtualization, you will have hit a lot of the same issues we have in the kernel. And it's very frustrating. It is very frustrating when you kind of expect that you are supposed to be able to trust the hardware and it turns out you can't, that you have to do a lot of extra work to, to fix hardware bugs. Um, the good news is 
it's much better than it was. Uh, the kind of security issues we see on the hardware side have, uh, have gotten more esoteric as time has gone on and uh, affect fewer and fewer people. Um, they do show up much more clearly and people care much more on the common architectures. x86, X86 ARM, uh, PowerPC in, in certain spaces, S390 in certain spaces. And then we support 15 other architectures that never see these kinds of security problems. But sometimes it's because they're in the embedded world and these are in-order machines and the amount of speculation they do is basically zero to begin with. So they really don't have that problem. And sometimes the issue is that there just isn't the same kind of maintenance and the same kind of hardware people standing behind their architecture and, and really digging into what could go wrong. So we've had a lot of painful hardware interactions. The good news is I've gotten used to them. I used to be very, very frustrated about this. I used to, this was my least favorite subject ever. But after five years, you kind of uh, grow inured to the pain. This is interesting. I was, I was gonna ask you about this because um, you say you're getting used to it. Um, have the vendors actually gotten better at disclosing, working with the community, providing reasonable patches, being responsive to the needs of the kernel here? That has got better too. It, it, part of the pain early on was this was a new process. And, and I don't know how many of you are inside hardware companies, but hardware companies work differently and they have different kind of time frames. And they're not used to the fact that you can fix a bug and release it and you have monthly patches or something like that. They have generations going back five years and, and to get some fundamental fix in takes at least three years and even then it will take another three or five years before, before most of your customers have converted. Uh, so the hardware companies were hard to work with. They wanted to have, we, on the se kernel security list, we have a rule that we will fix it within a week and, and after that, we disclose the, the patch. We will not hide. We may not disclose all the details about how you misuse the system, but we will make the patch public in, in within seven days because I find it so annoying to have a, like a 90-day disclosure date that I have to keep track of five different issues and some of them may or may not be all that important. So it's much easier for me to just disclose immediately and get, get the pain over and done with. And then you have hardware companies that say, okay, the release date for this issue is 12 months from now. <laughs> and you just go, shoot me now. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a big problem mainly because, especially in open source, the people who can fix it may be people you can't talk to. So then you have to kind of scrounge together this small group of people who have to fix this without talking to everybody else, without using all the public infrastructure we have for testing, without using all of that. So every time we then have a release of one of these security issues, the next two weeks will be spent always fixing up all the small details yeah. that oh, it didn't compile in this configuration because, by the way, you couldn't use all this infrastructure we have for testing, which is, which is very annoying. But as mentioned, we've been doing this for a while and we've been getting better at it, but it's, uh, it's not exactly the, my most favorite part of kernel development. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy I brought this up with you. Yeah. Um, so the kernel is of course a huge project but in the larger scheme of things it's a small part of the software uh, stacks that we are all running and and we just spent the last 10 minutes talking about all the challenges with getting security right in the kernel and then you look at eric's presentation and you look at the whole software supply chain and and you ask yourself how can you actually create a software stack that is reasonably secure, maybe not in the Fed ramp sense of there are no bugs in it because that was not written by a software developer, but um, that is reasonably secure. Is, is this something you ever think about, the well, bigger world? This is, yeah, I mean, we, 
the only way to make security work, because bugs will happen. If they don't happen in hardware, they will happen in software. And if they don't happen in your software, they will happen in somebody else's software. Yes. Uh, so just accept bugs, including the security ones. And the only way to try to make do security right is, is by having layers of security. And obviously, the kernel is just one layer. But in fact, inside the kernel, we end up having multiple layers of security. And some of them are purely about the tooling and how we build the software. And some of them are actual, um, we're using compilers to help us insert code automatically to add all the stack usage verifications dynamically. And some of them are somewhat expensive. Some of them are helped by having hardware support for uh, pointer authentication or pointer color testing and things like this. Uh, so even within the kernel, we have multiple layers of security for different parts. But when you're building a whole stack, every single layer in your stack needs to have some concept of what happened if I have a bug, do I have a fallback? Yeah. But also, what happens if there's a bug below me or, or above me? Uh, how do I deal with bad input, even from a supposedly trusted source? Uh, so uh, you'll never get there. You'll never, anybody who thinks you can get 100% secure is living in some dream world that is just not this reality. I mean, th this whole defense in depth that you can deal with bugs happening elsewhere. But one of the things that I often think about is if you look at a, at a software stack today, how do you actually know where the software comes from? How can you authenticate that the thing that you run is the thing that you think you're running? How can you make sure that the patches that are coming in are the patches from the right people instead of the patches from the wrong people? Yeah. I mean, this is not just typo squatting on various uh, uh, repositories that we see a lot of, unfortunately. But, but even well-meaning people upstream from you in a different layer in the stack could end up introducing a bug that affects you, or as we had a few months ago, could intentionally break the software to protest political things they disagree with. So to me, this, this, this bigger question of how do we secure the software stack is, is a topic where we could learn from the Linux kernel and from the ways the Linux kernel thinks about its layers and, and responses to bugs in different layers well, and to the, this web of trust that you have built. You say you trust your maintainers. This idea that there are people that you can trust that you get software from, I think is something that we need to expand on much more. Well, one of the problems here is that the kernel is kind of strange. I mean, if you look at the average uh, open source project, they really are often fairly small. There's a lot of these projects. I mean, for you slide, slide here at some point said that there's one maintainer or maybe zero. Uh, and that's not uncommon. There's a lot of projects that have five people that, and then the occasional drive-by patch. And then you compare that to the kernel where we have a couple of hundred maintainers. I mean, some of them are more central than others, but. I have about 50 maintainers. I interact with every single release. And every release has about 1,000 developers. So the kinds of issues we have are often very different from many other projects. I mean, there are other big Kubernetes. It's a huge project, but it's a very different project, again, from the kernel, where you tend to have these many smaller silos, maybe, where you have these sub-projects. Uh, that they all are under the same umbrella, but it's not one cohesive project in the same way that the kernel tends to be. And, and I think about it kind of in the same way, where I say the Linux kernel had, has dozens of maintainers, and they're all under one umbrella, and that's why it works. And in other spaces, we don't have that umbrella, but we need to figure out how still to create these trust relationships, how still we, are, we, we can understand what comes from others to us. But I don't want to make this a security talk. I want to talk about stuff that's fun. So let's, <laughs> somebody caught that, OK. Um, let's talk about things that you do for fun, technologies that are not 
software development. Ooh. Is there a life outside of the <laughs> screen in front of you? I remember uh, you tinkering with hardware in the COVID days. Yeah, I tried. Um, I'm a bad hardware developer. It turns out my problem is motivation. It, I really like doing software. Uh, I really like doing social software. I mean, not socially in the, like, <laughs> in the social space sense, but in the way that you talk with people over email, not face to face. <laughs> uh, there are a um, lot of caveats involved. Right. But I, during COVID, I actually spent a few months trying to learn how to design a small electronics board with a small microcontroller and sent off the the plans to China to be manufactured, and it came back, and the first version worked. And that Ooh. was great. And then it was a, now what? <laughs> right? <laughs> I learned to use the KiCad software to, to design it. I proved that I can do this, and I didn't actually want to create hardware, <laughs> it turns out. <laughs> but, but it was one of those things that's sometimes interesting to learn something new. Yeah. And, 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 and then you may realize that, okay, it wasn't really f what you wanted to do, but the learning experience was, was interesting in itself. Uh, I do do, as you know, I do uh, scuba diving, and I started another open source project that Dirk now maintains to do uh, log my dives, since for some odd reasons, all the dive uh, computer manufacturers didn't think that Linux was a big target for their dive logging software. Uh, so, but I, uh, yeah, I have to say, Linux is kind of my baby, and I've been doing it for 30 years plus, and, and it's what I do. Uh, my oldest daughter, when she went off to college and did computer science, I didn't push her, uh, she, she emailed me back like a few months, a few weeks later, and, and was laughing at the fact that, that I was known for Git at the computer science uh, department, even though I only did Git for f six months. I mean, I'll, I'll take credit for it, but but Git, it's not my it's not my baby. It's it was a side project that I just had to start to actually do Linux development. Uh, so all the actually credit for Git goes to Junio Hamano. So if you if you ever see Junio and you're a Git user, buy him a beer or something because he's been a great maintainer for Git and, and my name comes up much too often when it comes to Git. So I, I thought I was going to make it through a session without mentioning subsurface. Thanks for the plug. Okay. But I think we're out of time. So we will go back to our regular scheduled insanity. I hope we'll see some of you in Dublin on the third attempt. This year we'll really make it to Dublin and we'll be there in September and enjoy the beautiful, calm, quiet weather here in Austin and hopefully a fun conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. I always learn so much from Dirk and Linus, you know, I think even if you're with a sole maintainer project, there's a lot to learn. Um, I am excited to announce our next speaker, Todd Moore, who is the vice president um, of the, uh, IBM Open Technology and the chief developer advocate at IBM. He also has another cool job. He is the board president for OpenJS, so I, you know, think that's pretty cool. Um, and he here, he's here also to talk a little bit about security um, and more ways that you all can get involved um, to help, um, whether it's customers or governments, um, and really uh, tackle some of these important open source projects. Todd Moore. <laughs> Yeah. And really, Robin deserves a big, big cheer herself. Uh, she does a tremendous job for the OpenJS Foundation. So, thank you, thank you. So, um, first, I want to thank Eric Brewer for doing about 10 minutes of my 15-minute talk. Thank you, Eric. That was that was good. So, I think what I'll try to do is is hit on some other points along the way and uh, talk about how 
we can get involved in other ways. The, the, the whole s sphere of things that I think we need to be, be thinking about and doing. Um, but first, a commercial from the last time I was up here talking. Um, I tend to do these little talks for IBM at, at the open source uh, summits. And last time around, um, we had a project called the Adversarial Robustness Toolbox. And it graduated just here back in May, and I wanted to congratulate all those guys. They worked very hard. Uh, we started out with just a few people involved in the project. We've got a whole list of contributors now, 150,000 downloads, uh, 3,000 GitHub stars. And it supports basically all of the frameworks, all of the tasks, whether it's classification, object identification, uh, verifying machine learning models, et cetera. So a really excellent piece of work by the team. Great to see the project growing and, and moving. And if you're looking at how to get to trusted AI, go spend some time with the LFAI organization. I think you'll be really happy with, with what they're doing there. So again, congratulations to those guys. You worked really hard. And thank you, everybody who's joined the community. So Eric brought this up, and, and I thought I'll just hit a few other points, because the governments around the world really have started to pay attention to us. Um, it's no surprise if we sort of start off in the eastern part of the world. Uh, Eric didn't really mention too much about China. But China has an organization kind of similar to the Linux Foundation. Uh, OSPU that uh, is there to, or COPA, I should say, uh, COPU, uh, China, open source. Um, ugh, now I lost it. Anyway, they're, they're very similar to the Linux Foundation. They are out also promoting uh, security for, for open source. And they're working with the government standards organizations within China. Uh, the China Academy for Information uh, and uh, Communication Technology, uh, Cake, has uh, several work groups going, specifically looking at how to manage open source, uh, how to secure the open source supply chain, setting up standards that go way beyond just uh, simply how to have a, an SBOM, but to look at governance and all of the things that you need to have to feel like that open source software is suitable for use. 90% of Chinese enterprises these days use open source software. And they've started to contribute quite heavily. 37% of those organizations are contributing code to open source projects. So it's really hit the radar screen of, of the folks in China, in the standards bodies. And we're all trying to work with them. Because when you think about it, you just look at Europe now. Europe has uh, FOSA 2 that they're working through. Um, they're looking at how to securely audit how to, what you, know, you should do to go and manage that inventory, your software bill of materials again, how you should be looking at your FOSA projects. And, and they've already had a number of acts that uh, they've put in place. In 2021, there was the uh, EU AI Act, looking at setting standards around uh, uh, AI. Uh, the Data Act that came in 2022, and now there's a Cybersecurity Resiliency Act. And, as they look at what they're doing there, it's not just about um, the, the code. It's about how to maintain independence as well, too. They want to build uh, systems and solutions that guarantee that when problems happen, they're able to very quickly address them. And I, I thought that Linus's uh, comment about anybody who thinks that software is secure all the time, is really living in, in a fantasy world. And that's, that's really true. It's how you respond to it. It's how quickly you can go and spin that build and get that patch out, and how you inside your organizations can go about doing that. And then when we look at the US, there is a patchwork of things that are coming together. We've had uh, the White House uh, get involved, uh, put out some guidance to us. Uh, we've had organizations like NIST uh, prepare hundreds of pages of documentation that I'm sure every developer in the room has read by now, and you're all set, right? We're good, good. And, and, and it's <laughs> they're setting some conflicting things across some of the organizations as well, too. So, so we're starting to see this patchwork come about across the world, and it's something that we all need to pay attention to. It's something that we as open source 
contributors and consumers need to be aware of as, as we're working through uh, the code that we're going to take into our products and, and make use of across uh, the things that we're doing. So how should we respond, right? For me, that first slide said it all. It's all about community, 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 right? We're all in this together. That's my favorite saying these days is we're all in this together. And, and it's organizations like the OpenSSF that have come together that Eric also brought up that, that are really important. Um, and they need our support, right? And it's, it, it's not just um, you know, going to the White House and, and having a talk, uh, but it's getting involved. Uh, Jamie Thomas from out of IBM has taken up the chairperson role for the board for the OpenSSF. She's heavily involved, IBM is heavily involved, but we all need to be part of that. Every organization here needs to be looking at what the OpenSSF is doing and, and start to think about it. Um, you know, uh, Eric also mentioned Salsa, but I think in the big picture, the work that's being done in Salsa, everybody needs to take a look at. Where do you sit versus Salsa level one? Do you have a roadmap to get to Salsa level two and Salsa level three? These are things that you need to go and consider. These are places you ought to put your attention if you can. Uh, software bill of materials is, is just so important. People want to know what that dependency chain is across what you're building and be able to remediate when they find a problem. Quickly identify that, right? And, and for us, you know, really all I can say is get involved in places like SIGSTOR, SPDX, uh, Cyclone DX. So we're starting to normalize towards Cyclone DX, mostly because it's got excellent dependency tracking built into it, right? And, and it's got adapters to all the NVDs, and it's, it's policy-based vulnerability tracking, right? So um, get involved, take a look, think about these things because they're coming to you. Now, um, as I said before, CICD is also really important. Um, for us, Tecton is starting to underpin everything, right? Great project, can't say enough for what the, the world is doing there. We use it across the infrastructure and, it, and hopefully you can take a look at it as well too. Um, one of the great things that I've seen in actually what's been going on in the JavaScript world with the Node.js side of things is having a security release person who is now working in the release to make sure that we're tracking the, the security issues and, and taking a lot of that burden off of the rest of the release team as we're going out and building things. So um, you can find that all the meetings for, for Node.js and, and OpenJS are available through uh, YouTube. You can go, you can take a look, you can see for yourself what's going on in there. Um, the OpenSSF has a lot of great assets. They have things like scorecard, right? Go take a look at the project you have. Look at where they score in that. You may find that some of the things might become questionable for you uh, when you take a look at that, right? Um, but, you know, there's a dashboard. There's work you can do with Salsa. There's work with SBOMs. Um, there's all sorts of, of great assets and training as well that come through the organization. So get involved. And then lastly, um, for those who are strong in security, take the time to go out and help and train others across the organizations, right? It's, it's not enough to just be the expert. You, we need to train a whole new generation of experts. And there's a couple of things that we're doing along the way to, to try to help that. But first, let me say one more thing. And again, this goes back to Robin. 98% of the world's uh, web properties have JavaScript, right? When we look at product stacks that we have, the first thing you have to do is take all the JavaScript work and put it off to the side so you can see all the other underlying projects that you have that are potentially areas where there might be vulnerabilities. That's at least what happens with us. It's, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So the OpenSSF has chosen Node.js to be one of the first targets for going out and supporting the organization. Uh, there's a $300,000 investment that's gone there, and, and it's going to be you know, targeted at improving the security of the code base. So think about this. This, is, this has a fairly high criticality score um, and uh, wide use, 2 billion downloads in 2021. Um, this is a, an organization that every company in the room should figure out how they want to go and support. So when Robin comes around looking for people to come and sign up and be participants within the OpenJS Foundation, please give that some consideration. 
But we need to also skill up people, as I was saying, right? Um, the capability of our, our workforce needs to grow. Um, it has to leverage the technologies that I've been talking about. It has to work with academia to go and skill up people and make sure that our academic institutions are in line with the latest thinking. It has to go and work with even secondary schools, with our high school students, our teachers, our, our individuals who are just there who, who should be aware of this now because they're building the next generations of software. We see this all the time and they're very involved in open source. And then of course, we need to give opportunities to people who haven't necessarily had a chance to, to participate in the workforce in this way and potentially can, can add a lot to that. So uh, one of the activities that we have done is made a commitment, and this was actually announced last year, but I just wanted to reiterate it because it came up at the White House uh, not that long ago again, is that you know, we're committed to producing as much support as we possibly can for the historically black community uh, colleges or, and universities. Thank you. And, and I can't entreat you all enough to go and, and look for other areas where you can go do something similar, right? We're hoping to grow 150,000 cybersecurity skills over the next three years. And, and we want to go to these well-established centers of, of learning and help them along the way and, and work towards careers and positions in cybersecurity. So thank you. But we're also putting things out there for free as well, too. So the IBM Security Learning Academy is free. You don't have to spend any money. It's a single portal. It's uh, easy to connect to. It's interactive. You can do individualized learning. Um, there is guided training roadmaps as well, too, here. Uh, please give us feedback on it. It's, it's set up to collect NPS and understand what the needs are of the students. Um, it's interlocked with our security communities, and it has even regular open mic sessions. You can come, you can get badge, badges to help you along your career. We highly recommend that you go, and, and especially in the open source projects, have people who are badged up on the security practices, the best practices. So here's a place to get started and, and a place where we hope you'll come and join us. All right, so last couple of points. Support your communities. Be out there, be participants. Don't just be consumers of the code. One way you can go and help other folks is to, in those communities, do the security work, is to take up the chopping wood and carrying water. And those are things like code reviews, doing documentation, helping out with testing, supporting the CICD infrastructure. All those kinds of tasks can offload the people who are in the community to go and take on the tough security issues that come up. So don't be shy about it. There's good work that everybody can do across the communities. Learn about S-bombs. It's, it's really important. This is one you should walk away with and make sure you're paying attention to that. Um, it's going to be across the world. This is not, not something that is going to be optional. We don't necessarily have to publish them all to the world, but we know, do know have to I should say, we, we do have to be able to create them, maintain them, and, and use them when a security issue comes up because we absolutely positively know security issues will come up. Vulnerability, vulnerabilities will surface, and we need to address them and understand the dependency tree underneath things. So um, get out there and just help us uh, improve the execution and security, and um, I'm sure every community will be there and, and and very much appreciate the work that you go and do if you come and help in any way. Lastly, a uh, couple of advertisements. Stop by the Code Cafe. Um, we've got lots of good things going on there. Emily Jang is one of my favorite people. She's uh, signing her book on uh, practical cloud native Java development with MicroProfile. Emily's in the audience. Um, please, uh, she's uh, done a great job. Come participate with us. There's lots of other good things going on there as well, too, that you can see. Pick up some swag. And we've got lots of sessions, right? So things on security, things on all sorts of different things, uh, things on Java, the supply chain, et cetera. So just come and join us. And, and I want to say thank you all for, for listening. And I want to, right on time, last couple of seconds. And, and again, another shout out there to, to Eric. Thank you for doing all the other part of my talk so that I got to go and talk about those things. So thank you.
Thanks, Todd. All right. You know, one thing I really appreciate, appreciate about Todd, you know, and Eric, but really at IBM and also at Red Hat, we have folks in our community, it's like their day job is to work on our open source projects. And imagine if everybody did that, I think we'd have a lot more secure software. Um, so right now I'm really looking forward to sitting down with our next keynote speaker to talk a little bit about leadership and how that's changed since the pandemic. Um, Amy Gilliland is president of the General Dynamics Information Technology, which is a business unit of General Dynamics Corporation. In 2018, Amy led the integration of one of the in industry's largest IT acquisitions, creating a new entity focused on employee-oriented uh, culture. Um, today, GDIT is an $8.5 billion global tech company with nearly 30,000 technologists, uh, service professionals, uh, delivering mission critical services and software to many. Um, and we asked Amy here today to talk about the linkage between compassionate leadership and business performance. Um, please welcome Amy Gilliland. Thanks Hi. so much for being here. It's awesome to be it's here. It's so great to meet you back there. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I grew up in, in Maryland. Uh -huh. I uh, grew up just outside of Baltimore and went to the Naval Academy, which was my dream as a young child. And I graduated from the Naval Academy and uh, was a surface warfare officer. Wow. So I Amazing. served on Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyers, which were also built by General Dynamics. I know we were talking backstage a little bit, so we have yeah. a business unit in Bath, Maine that builds destroyers. So served on those wow. for a while and then made a difficult decision to get out of the military. And I wasn't really ready to leave the mission. Uh -huh. The mission still really mattered to me. It was all I had known as an adult. And so I went to the defense industry, which is in my mind sort of six degrees of separation. From, uh, from actually being in the uniform. Wow. And so as a federal service integrator, mm -hmm. GDIT's job is to uh, bring technology to the mission. And so that is why being here is such an exciting opportunity for me because we think about pairing decades of, we sit with the mission on the front lines and decades of experience doing that and understanding the existing infrastructure and the people and the processes and how we interject technology, open source software is de facto, it is our default when we are looking yeah. at bringing technology there because of its scalability, because of its reliability, because of its maintenance and all of the things that everybody yeah. here understands. Yeah. So it is a really big part of, of my business. In fact, I was, I was looking on the way down here. We have um, a number of projects, but our, our whole open, um, our software factory is 90% open source software. So Amazing. Um, this community has an important role to play in the mission that we support, and, and I'm so grateful wow. for that. Wow, thanks everyone, wow, amazing. That's like huge at scale. Yeah, it's, a, it's making a difference at a time arguably that it's never been more important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so prior to the pandemic, you know, you were known to really run your division with really an employee focused culture. Can you sort of expand on, on that idea and yeah. what that means? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So you mentioned in your opening that we had this unique opportunity in, in 2018, General Dynamics bought um, a company that was about four and a half billion dollars and added it to its existing IT infrastructure company and so more than dub doubling the size. And so we had, it was the largest acquisition in the corporation's um, history and so it needed to be successful. Acquisitions um, are hard anyhow, acquis right? Acquisitions yeah, are yeah. hard. Uh -huh. um, but you know, we made a decision at that point that we had a unique opportunity that many of us don't get to create something altogether new. Uh -huh. And so if, if it's by the people, for the people, uh -huh. they, they have a hand in contributing and building that culture. And so we took, we took advantage of that opportunity and it was 
an angle that was very values and culture built. So we have values, and as I was reflecting on them, honesty, trust, transparency, and alignment, it is what open source software totally, is all about. Absolutely, right. And so we wanted, we wanted to be people focused from the beginning. It was critical to us, and it's not just, when, when people feel like they have import and they're adding to an organization, and many people come to our industry because of the mission. They want to contribute to national security yeah. or supporting federal citizens. Um, so for us, it's, it's recruiting and retaining employees, yeah. but also being able to contribute to the mission in a meaningful way. So, so it wasn't it really about the people. forcing one culture into another culture. It was just that doesn't work. No. It couldn't it couldn't be it couldn't be we, we banned the word legacy, it became a curse oh, that's word. Good. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so we created something altogether new oh, and uh, values based. Wow. Amazing. So since the pandemic hit, how did that sort of change the culture of your yeah. team? Your big your big team. Everything changed Everything in the changed. pandemic. Yeah. I was listening to the remarks, you know, uh -huh. before me, yeah. and, and I know for the open source software, you were, you were, many of you were remote before Kinda remote was cool. Remote. I get that. Uh -huh. um, but I still think that everybody endured something during COVID, right. whether it was a loss of a loved one mm -hmm. um, or loss of a job or whatever illness. Um, and so... Your three kids juggling their... <laughs> yes, oh I did become a tier one IT specialist, to which my 10-year-old oh told me, I do not excel, um, but uh, mm -hmm. but but actually, COVID has changed employees, and employers are receiving back employees that are profoundly different and have different needs. So, for us, that means that when I am figuring out how to empower and support my employees, I need to look at it through a new lens. Because if my employees are supported, they're supporting my customers yeah. and their missions. Yeah. And so for us, I'll give you a couple of examples of that. One, employee well-being. So we are offering um, resources now that didn't think of or focus on before the pandemic. For example, mental health. Yeah. And you know we can talk about that in more detail, but there is a lot that happened in COVID, and, and people are suffering and struggling as a yeah. result of that. But also, are there any caregivers or parents in here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Lots, yeah. um, elder care, special needs care, yeah. child care, and there's a shortage. And so we have a resource now that we call it's called Wealthy, yeah. and it helps caregivers arrange appointments and do those sorts of nice. things that allow us to be productive at work. Yeah. And so um, employee well-being is something that we are doing differently. Mm -hmm. Employee development, I think we all had a moment, I don't want to channel that on anybody in this room, but we all had a moment in COVID which was, what am I doing in life? How yeah. am I spending my time? Yeah, am I absolutely. spending my time in the right place? And so I grew up having many different jobs in my career. Mm -hmm. I appreciate all those experiences yeah. that I had. And I find that employees want to know that companies care for them, that you have a plan and a trajectory and that you're investing in them. Yeah. So we're looking at employee development in a very deliberate fashion now and using actually AI and technology oh, to help them find new opportunities within yeah. our business. So that's more than just technical training. Oh, yes. yes. No, more, yeah. more than certifications. Uh -huh. People want a, a map, right? And, yeah. and a map doesn't always go like this. Yeah, it can yeah, go yeah. like this or like, like this. That, right? uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's a mindset, actually. Oh, and a mindset takes a long time to inculcate into an organization. Oh. And so we're really focused on that. The last thing that I would say that we are thinking about differently is culture. Mm -hmm. And culture is sort of a trite word in my mind, um, and you touch it and feel it differently. Um, but I know that we have a vibrant culture when we are taking on topics that are really important to employees. So for instance, in the aftermath of Buffalo, you know, we have employee resource groups, we're having conversations about what happened there. Mm -hmm. um, we have employees that have children that are dealing with anxiety in a way yeah. that they didn't before COVID. Yeah. Um, we have veteran suicide issues, yeah. about 30% of my population wow. is veteran. Yeah. So a culture where people 
come to do more than just transactional IT work. They come to be part of a community where they can be themselves, and that is something that we're focusing yeah. on as the societal issues that we deal with are um, it's enormous. It's so important. You spend so much of your life, right? At yeah, work. well, we're a people company, yeah. and, uh, and so we have to enable people to be successful. Amazing. I love that. Um, so how did any of your personal experiences sort of shape some of the changes that you drove? Yeah, well, you're comfortable? Um, no, it's a good question. Yeah. You know, as I alluded to, um, I'm a parent. Yeah. Um, I'm a special needs parent. Uh -huh. um, I also, um, I lead a, a company with leaders that struggled, that I watched struggle, have, yeah. you know, difficult experiences mm -hmm. during the pandemic. And actually I was, um, uh, at a local lake on vacation in August of last year, and one of my employees called me to, one, one of my reports called me to tell me that we had an employee suicide. And that was following two suicides that I had sort of tangentially been related to in other parts of my life. And it was just evident that we are in, you know, people are really struggling. We're yeah. in a difficult place. And so we started a campaign, a mental health campaign called How Are You Really? Um, so. When we were backstage, I said, oh, how are you? Yeah. I'm great. They told me to take this whole thing on during my layover. I'm awesome. <laughs> oh, well, tell me, how are you really? <laughs> um, but Terrified. Often, <laughs> I know. Oftentimes, yeah. when, when you ask, uh -huh. and particularly in a remote world, yeah. um, the really part of it you don't always stick around for. Yeah. And so that profoundly impacted me. Yeah. And we really doubled down in our leaders with 30,000 employees the, the, the 12 or 15 yeah. or 20 or 50 yeah. at the top, they in and of themselves can't drive change. Yeah. You have to be attentive. And so we really pushed compassionate, empathetic, yeah. attentive leadership. And um, it's made a difference. Good. I'm going to say, how are you really all to you this yeah, week? Yeah, you have to stop and wait for the answer. People will tell you. I know. They and will. I think especially in the U.S., how are you? Fine. Thank you. How are you? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we just, we sort of think we're having this return to normalcy sort of post pandemic. Um, anybody feel normal? I don't know. I don't normal. feel very normal. Yeah. No. No. So do you see, I mean, are you all returning back to the, to the workplace? What's happening? Okay, yeah, no, here? we are, we are returning back to the, uh -huh. to, to the workplace, but I, I don't think that there's the new normal, whatever that's going to yeah. be. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but we're not going back to where we were before. Yeah. And so it is incumbent on us as leaders and employers and yeah. organizations to understand that we are in a inherently different period. And people, employees, from my perspective and experience mm -hmm. thus far, they want to work at a place that cares about them, mm -hmm. and they want to work at a place where they can make a difference. Yeah. And yeah. it is incumbent upon us to make that possible. Amazing. Um, you know, one thing I love about the open source community is that it is very distributed, right? Different kind of people, countries, cultures. Um, and so if you look, you know, at sort of how you were saying it was sort of before cool distributed, but what advice could we bring in our open source projects? Because we can always do better, right? To have healthy communities from some of the lessons that you're using yeah. with your team. You know, I was giving that a lot of thought. You know, the, the whole precept or covenant that the open source software community yeah. has is collaboration for the greater good. Yeah. yeah. And what I admire so much about that covenant is that you don't need a title to be a leader or to innovate in this community. Yeah. And in fact, by default, it seems that the leadership and influence that you have is mostly predicated on how you inspire and collaborate with others. And so if you pull that thread for a moment, I would say in this moment, when technology is evolving so quickly and when um, parochially um, the missions I support are changing so quickly and democracy is being threatened in parts of the world, 
there's never been a more important opportunity for leaders in this community to make a difference. And I would advocate that that compassion and empathy um, in our um, company, uh, post-COVID, compassionate leadership is a requirement. Mm -hmm. And so as this, this foundation and culture that the open source um, community is based on, treasure that and protect it. Mm -hmm. And as you think about leading in that environment and driving it forward, be kind and mm -hmm. compassionate. We are not all, and I will include myself in that, bringing our best selves every day. There's a lot of stresses going on, and we don't always put our best foot yeah. forward. But if we lead with that empathetic and compassionate um, leadership, it makes a difference. We found in my company, um, because I'm not just a, a, a nice all the time kind of leader, you have to have results, right? right but yeah. when people are supported, they perform. I have evidence of that. Um, we had some of our best performances of companies through COVID. Mm -hmm. And when they're inspired, they innovate. And mm -hmm. so I would advocate for that. It's good business, right? Yeah. Um, here's a topic I like to ask everybody, not just women in tech. or. Um, but you came from the Navy. I did. And then you're in defense, you know, and sort of traditional. So you know, you may have been the We're only... not as traditional as you thought it was. No, obviously We're not. We're very fun Obviously in defense, not. And, you know, community. you've been like being, being the only woman in the room. Like, how do you, how do you navigate, I mean, any of those challenges along the way? I have to admit, there's still some challenges along the way. Yeah, yeah. no, uh -huh. well, I mean, I guess I would say, so first and foremost, mm -hmm. this is not your, like, father's defense company. Right um, on. So <laughs> the defense <laughs> industry is very changed, and in That's fact, cool. At least, uh, a year or so ago, I stopped counting, but so many of them are led by women right now. Wow. So um, there is, uh, my, my boss is, is a woman, the, the woman that runs General Dynamics, um, and, and so are many of the defense companies. And so that certainly helps. Nice. But I think we all have a role to play. And so I yeah. look at it in terms of my own little piece of the world with yeah. 30,000 employees. Yeah. How can I affect change there? Yeah. And we are, we are looking, that in, uh, looking at that in a couple of different ways. One, representation, right? Mm -hmm. People have to look up and see themselves. That's true. And you know, we are doing pretty well from a gender perspective in my leadership team, but from a diversity perspective, we have to and must do better. Yeah. And when we look at um, what happens, we actually have a pretty diverse pipeline, um, but we attrite diverse talent mid-career. And so we have yeah. some programs that we've designed to sort of go after that. Oh, nice. How can we bring diversity into the top ranks? I think the other... Um, uh, another idea that we're really focused on is that you want your company to be a destination. Yes, you want true. it to be that kind of yeah. company where you're having real conversations, where people can be forthright, where everybody has a voice. And I know that sounds trite, but it means having difficult conversations and bringing everybody in. We had a great uh, event last week. Uh, Bry Scurry, who is a World uh, Cup winner and two-time gold medalist uh, soccer goalie um, cool. came to talk about her mental health struggles. Uh -huh. um, and so having some of those hard conversations, I think, are really yeah. important. And then for us in the pipeline, and I was really encouraged to hear mm -hmm. the last speaker talk about um, historically black colleges. Yeah. That is a place where we're recruiting. Great. We are looking at bringing talent in earlier. And for us, that's really important because security clearances um, can be difficult yeah. in the earlier that we can get those started. So oh, nice. a multifaceted approach, but everybody has a voice in our company that we're building ourselves. That's cool. So one thing I like to ask folks, and it wasn't on our list, yeah. but you know, what's a good day look like for you at work? A great day a at great work for day. me is one spent with employees. Yeah. When I get to go out and see the mission and what we do, and that's why I'm so grateful to this community. If you could see how that is being applied to our national security missions, it is truly inspiring. Yeah, and pretty darn cool. People yeah. care desperately yeah. about what they do yeah. and uh, working yeah. tirelessly, yeah. particularly now, 24 seven. It's yeah. amazing, yeah, I think it, it tells me that everything that we all do and you all do really matters. And when I see it, you know, 
living in your in your company. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, making a difference in the world for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Then it becomes a destination. Right? It does become a destination. That's great. I love yeah. that. I love yeah. that. Great. Well, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. And uh, again, thanks. The open source community is a huge yeah. part of what we're doing at GDIT, and we're here to to learn and listen from your best practices during this conference. So really proud to be a part of this. Great. Thanks so thank much. You. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Great, thanks. <laughs> Great. Okay, thank you so much. What amazing speakers we had. Um, Y'all need some coffee, maybe some iced coffee, right? That's in level four. Don't know about the ice. Uh, please do go check out the, um, the organizations on our sponsor showcase. That'll be super cool. Uh, conference sessions start at 11.10, and if you have any questions, reach out to me or any of our LF staff, or we're here for you. Thanks. See you tonight. Uh -huh. for you yeah don't complicate it yeah cause I know you and you know everything about me I can't remember all of the nights I don't remember when you're around me I've been dancing on top of cars and stumbling out of bars I follow you through the dark can't get enough you're the medicine and the pain the tattoo inside my brain and maybe you know it's obvious I'm a sucker for you Say the word and I'll go anywhere blindly I'm a sucker for you yeah. Any road you take, you know that you'll find me I'm a sucker for all I'm a sucker for you. I'm a sucker for you.